We are going to be in Acts chapter 13. So you can turn there in your Bibles. In Acts chapter 13, we began the chapter last week. We're going to be completing the chapter today, but we'll be in Acts chapter 13. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 52 at how the gospel is relevant for today. And it is. Oh my goodness. It is so, so necessary. So last week, we began Acts chapter 13. We looked at this major turning point, as we described it, in the historical record of the church that's given to us here in this book. And we were reminded of the command of the Lord to go and make disciples of all people and of his instruction to wait for the Helper. For the Lord gave instruction, saying, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And that's exactly what happened. Over the first 12 chapters of Acts, we tracked the path that the church took as they began to fulfill that plan. We studied how the church was born on the day of Pentecost, how it grew in Jerusalem. And how after the martyrdom of Stephen, when a great persecution arose, we saw how the church dispersed from Jerusalem and went throughout Judea and Samaria. And last week, we looked at how the Lord called Barnabas and Saul, how he had set them aside for the work that he had called them to, how they were to go to the end of the earth and share the gospel to all Jews and Gentiles alike. And then we looked at when they had left for Cyprus. And we were told of the encounter that they had with the Roman proconsul over the region, Sergius Paulus, as he was seeking to hear the word of God. But there was also a deceiver there, a self-proclaimed sorcerer, who sought to pervert and twist the way of the Lord, all with a desire to turn the proconsul from the faith and instead draw him after himself. And in chapter 13, verse 9, it says, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And there with that verse, that passage, we saw how Saul became an apostle. How he stepped into his apostolic authority and he became Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. Saul, who's also called Paul. And here in the moment of their first confrontation with the enemy who wished to distort and twist the truth, Saul came full circle from where he had begun. He No more was he trying to debate his way to force others to see the truth of who Jesus is. No more is he arguing and striving to prove an intellectual point. No more bluster in self. Saul had learned something. And we reviewed it last week, how he had learned, as he described in Philippians 3, how he had learned about himself. In Philippians 3, 4 through 11, he writes, he said, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's what Paul had learned. That all those things he counted dear before, he counted as loss for the cross. He learned who he is in Christ was far more important than who he was before Christ. Saul became Paul. And Paul was who God had in mind to be the apostle that he envisioned. For up to this point, it had always been listed Barnabas and Saul. But from now on, from that verse on, it's going to be Paul and Barnabas. 
This is where instead of standing in his own knowledge, his own debating skill, his own wiles and machinations, Paul relied on the prompting and the power of the Holy Spirit alone. The great one, Saul, had become the little one, Paul. And that was the one that the Spirit could use. And the proconsul, we are told, believed. In Acts 13, verse 12, it says, And the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. We're told he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He had seen what had been done, but he was astonished at the teaching. As amazing as the miracle of suddenly blinding the sorcerer was, the good news the proconsul heard from Paul was even more amazing to him. He was astonished. And he said to be the, at the teaching of the Lord, not the miraculous work before his eyes. The thing that is pointed to is primarily the power of, in Paul's teaching. What impressed the proconsul was not the miracle. That simply confirmed what he had heard, what he was already astonished by. What impressed him was the teaching, the remarkable, radical doctrine of Christianity, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became man and that he gave his life for every human being who would receive him and had resurrection power to rise from the dead, all for the sake of redeeming all of mankind trapped in sin and death. That's what amazed the proconsul. That's what impressed him and made him believe. And now this morning, we're going to look at Acts 13, verses 14 through 52, where we will see the first recorded sermon of the Apostle Paul. How God uses one man to change the course of world history through the power of the Spirit of the living God. And he did so by the preaching of the word of truth, given in love with a fervent desire To see all people, men and women, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, devout or pagan, anyone, anywhere. He desired all of them to come to the knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ. And the freedom and liberty that comes in the life we have in Christ. The intimacy of a relationship that we have with God through Christ. All these things that Paul learned once he had encountered Jesus Christ on that dusty road to Damascus. And through the years where he was set aside learning from the Lord... Over, for over a decade, all of the aspects of life in Christ. He evangelized, he taught, he preached, he instructed, he pastored, and he wrote faithfully. And here we have a good example of how he did it. Paul had preached many messages before, but this is the first of which we have a record. It was a very powerful message, and he gave the gospel very clearly. It was preached in a synagogue on a Sabbath morning, and we're told that it shook a whole city, so much so that in verse 44 in Acts 13, we read on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. That had to be one powerful message. And as such, we need to examine it in some detail to see what made it of such impact and what elements make it so relevant, radical, and revolutionary still today. Now, if you don't think it's significant today, then you've probably never really heard it or truly considered what Paul says here. But let's stand together, and we're going to read through our text for today, Acts 13, verses 14 through 52. We're going to begin in verse 14. It says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. 
after John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. But as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him, though they found no cause for death in him. They asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings. That promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what was, has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work in your days, a work which, will, which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many has, as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you for what you did through the power of your Holy Spirit through these men, Paul and Barnabas, just moving in faithfulness. And the fruit that remains and is in our lives even today. Lord, I pray that you'd be here with us, that you'd speak to us, and that you would teach us what you intend to teach us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You could be seated. <coughs> now, if you remember, we closed last week's passage by learning that Paul and his party left Cyprus and headed to Perga, which is in modern-day Turkey. And there John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem, and now they leave Perga from Perga and they continue traveling. And we're told in verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. We're told they came to Antioch. Now, if you remember... A couple of chapters ago, where did Paul and Barnabas leave from? They left from Antioch to begin this missionary journey. But this is not the Antioch in Syria, which they left to go to Cyprus. This is another Antioch in the region of Pisidia, which was part of the ancient Roman province of Galatia. Now, all in all, 
<laughs> there were 16 or 17 cities named Antioch throughout the ancient world. And if you remember, when we studied Acts 11, we discussed the founding of Syrian Antioch on the Orontes River, which became the base for the church. It was founded by a Greek general named Seleucius Nicator, who rose to power after the death, death of Alexander the Great, and he named the city after his father, Antiochus. And in fact, he founded multiple cities, and he named more than one after his father. That's where some of the multiple Antiochs come from. Now, with all those Antiochs, it, it can get a little confusing, but for our studies, the Bible's only concerned with two of the Antiochs. They're only, they're only mentioned two of them, Syrian Antioch, Antioch, the base of the church, and this one in Pisidia of the Roman province of Galatia. So they didn't return back where they came from. This is a different Antioch. Syrian Antioch was the base of the church. This is in the Roman province of Galatia. So when you read Paul's letter to the Galatians, you're reading a letter written to the Christians in the cities which were reached right here on these, this first missionary journey. There were Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, all cities that are in the region of Galatia. So once Paul and Barnabas arrived, though, where'd they go? They went straight to the synagogue according to the custom which Paul had adopted because God had said that the gospel was to go to the Jew first and then to the Greek. In verse 15, it says, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Now, a first century synagogue service, well, they followed a basic order, a general order of service. First, opening prayers were offered, and then there was a reading from the law, you know, one of the first five books of the Old Testament, and then there was a reading from the prophets. Then, if there was an educated person present, they were invited to speak on subjects related to the readings. So according to the custom of the synagogue, especially as educated strangers were there, they were invited to speak. And given the customary invitation, Paul was more than happy to use the opportunity to share. And with that, we're given opportunity to look at Paul's first recorded sermon. Not on YouTube, I checked, but his first recorded sermon. It falls into three basic divisions, which, we'll all take, which we're going to take a look at, so that we might understand the power of this word, the giving of the gospel. First, let's look at verses 16 through 25. It says, Then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. So men of Israel and you who fear God, those would be the proselytes. They weren't Jewish, but they're ones that had converted to Judaism. Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. When he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, who do you think I am? I am not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Now, if you think back to Acts chapter 7, you, you may remember the sermon of Stephen. When he was brought before the Sanhedrin and he had the opportunity to speak, you may have noticed that the introduction that Saul uses is of the same style of the sermon that Stephen gave to the Sanhedrin. When he stood there before the rulers of the Jews, of which Saul of Tarsus was a member, a member of the Sanhedrin, he was there in that group. He listened to Stephen. And here in the first message we see from Paul, he begins the same way Stephen did. He recounts the history of Israel. In order to try and awaken his kinsmen to an understanding of God's love and concern. And of his sovereign direction of their nation. I don't think Paul ever forgot the power of that message Stephen gave, even though it cost Stephen his life. The reality is that message 
had reached Paul's own heart. It had cut through all the anger, hatred, and egotism. It had planted a seed of faith in his heart, which was ultimately brought to fruition on the road to Damascus, resulting in his conversion. Which is why God, or why Jesus told Saul that it was hard for him to kick in against the goads. He had been fighting against the words that gnawed at his heart, that echoed in his mind, all while seeing in his mind's eye the stoning of the one who faithfully delivered that message. The guilt he must have felt over that. A death which he consented to at the time. A death which he supervised. And yet those words coming back over and over, all the while Saul trying to kick them away with a hatred and a fervor that drove him to a murderous rage. But the seed remained. And ultimately blossomed into a life that shook the entire world. You never know what seed you're going to plant when you share the gospel with someone. You don't know just being faithful to share his love with someone else. They may be kicking and screaming against what you have to say. They may be laughing at your face. They may go into a murderous rage. But God's word doesn't return void. That seed that you plant, who knows what it may blossom into when Jesus may get them to the point where they look at them and go, you know, it's been hard for you to kick against the goat, isn't it? You ready now? Are you ready? You don't have to worry about the result. It is not your job to create a blossom in someone. That's the Holy Spirit's job. All you can do is cast the seed, the Word of God, and trust that God is going to do the work that only God can do. And for Saul, that's exactly what happened. That's the effect it had on him. That's the effect it had on him. And it's no wonder to me that here he's following the same tactic as Stephen. Paul cites a history that's completely centered on God. And it's God who's working. And that's the history, I think, that as it ought to be written. The deeds, actions, and influence of God and the people that he worked through. That's what we have in our Bible. The record of all the things God has left for us to study and to know about having a relationship with him. And now the apostle points out a few different instances of what God did in the nation of Israel. He said, God chose our fathers, made the people great. He led them out of Egypt. God put up with them in the wilderness. That's a big deal. God put up with them in the wilderness. God destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, gave them their land as an inheritance. God gave them judges. Then they asked for a king. God gave them Saul. And when God had removed him, he raised up David. And finally, God has brought into Israel a savior, Jesus, just as he promised. It all culminates in the coming of the Lord Jesus himself. And then he cites John the Baptist's testimony as to the greatness of Jesus. And Paul quotes his testimony to the fact that the one who was coming after him was so great that John himself said he was not worthy to even untie his shoe. Now that's an introduction. And the second division, it's in verses 26 through 31. And here you have the facts of the gospel. The ministry, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 26 says, Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of the salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God, I love that phrase, but God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him in from Galilee to Jerusalem who are witnesses to the people. <coughs> you know, we can think that sharing the gospel is so difficult. That we have to have degrees. And that we got to know every little bit and detail. And we can turn it into such a confusing mess or make it hard to define or nebulous in thought or direction. But Paul didn't have that problem. To him, the gospel is very clear. It consisted of the great acts of God in history. The coming of the Lord Jesus, his ministry among men, his crucifixion because of the sins of men, and his resurrection as the scriptures had promised. He wrote it out for us again in 1 Corinthians 15, 
verses 1 through 8, where he said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered you, first of all, that which I also received. And then there's a colon right there in the verse. And from there, he shares the gospel. Listen to this. You want to know how to share the gospel? Right here he shares it. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and He was seen by Cephas, Peter, then by the twelve. And after that, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, He was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And last of all, He was seen by me also as one born out of due time. It doesn't get more succinct than that. But that's it. That's the good news. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul was convinced that that was all he needed to share. He didn't need to go into a debate on the finer points of Calvinism. He didn't need to go on a debate over, over any different aspect of whether we should speak in tongues or not. Is that a gift for today or not? Are the gifts alive or are they not? You know, it didn't matter if he wasn't saying we need to be Pentecostal or Baptist. He wasn't saying anything there. All he was saying is that it points to Jesus. There is one church that our Savior is coming back for. And that's any that belong to him. It doesn't matter what we call ourselves. What matters is are we in love with Jesus Christ? Are we in love with the one we say we follow? Because he's coming back for his church. Not a church by a specific name. It all has to go back to that. What do we do with the cross? Now in our passage in Acts here too, it's not overcomplicated, but Paul answers the question that a lot of the Jews had and a lot of people have about that. Well, if Jesus was the Messiah predicted by the Old Testament scriptures and if he fulfilled all those prophecies, then why didn't they recognize him? Well, Paul gives the answer. And there were two reasons. He said, first, they didn't recognize him because they didn't pay attention to him. They didn't really see Jesus. They were misled by the superficialities about Jesus. They looked at his trade, his background, saw that he was but a carpenter's son. They saw that he had no money, no influence or standing in society. They saw that he had no prestige. He had never been to school, had been taught at no great scholar's feet, and so they wrote him off and paid no attention to him. They didn't hear his words. They didn't see his miracles, or if they did, they immediately forgot them, discounted them, or scorned them. They put no stock in them. And so to them, Jesus lived the most insignificant of lives, and they desired to do away with him. But the reality is, Jesus Christ lived the most magnificent life that has ever been lived before by any man. But his contemporaries never saw it. They didn't recognize their own Messiah. A lot of people are blind in that way today, just like the Jews of Jesus' day because of the second reason that Paul gives. They didn't understand the Scriptures. Who were people who had heard the utterances of the prophets every Saturday and read them in synagogue? We went over what the structure of a service in a synagogue was like. Every week they would listen to the law, they would listen to the prophets. Many of them knew it by heart, but it was head knowledge. They didn't truly understand it. They didn't take it seriously. It was duty, not relationship. As Jesus said in Matthew 15, these people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I think it's the same thing he says today about the church. In the church today. We may draw near to him with the mouth. We may honor him with our lips. We may sing songs about the relationship we have with him. But is it real? Is our heart far from him? Or are we in a love relationship with him? It's a sad indictment. And we can look at the people in the Jews of Jesus' day and go, oh, boy, they missed it. But the reality is the church can be complacent today and do the exact same thing. Because it's still a matter of our own heart. What are we going to do with what Jesus has done for us? For them, the reading of the scriptures had become just a religious rite, a perfunctory performance gone through automatically every, every Sabbath. 
People went and did their thing in synagogue and then they went home again. That was all there was to it. It's a lot like the church today. We'll come to church on a Sunday. We'll go home and immediately forget about it and live the rest of our week to come back to church again on Sunday. Go, ah, we did our duty. I did my thing. I did my church thing. But that was there. That doesn't apply out here. Is that abiding in Christ? Is that living a life of bearing fruit for Him? Is that a love relationship? I don't think it is. But that was why the, they missed the coming of the Son of God and didn't recognize Him as Messiah. They didn't understand their own scriptures. Now Jesus is going to come again. I pray that we recognize His coming because that we're all with Him when He comes again. But there's going to be many people at the end of time that are going to stand before Him and say, I did this in your name. I did that in your name. He's going, yeah, but... You never knew me, and I never knew you. It's about the relationship we have with the one who gave up everything to bridge the gap so that we could have a relationship with him to begin with. And here Paul says that those people that missed it actually fulfilled the prophecies by condemning Jesus and turning him over to Pilate. And from there he goes into the third division of his, of his sermon. Paul takes those great truths, the ministry of Jesus and his resurrection, and he uses the scriptures to point to the fulfillment of them. Beginning in verse 32, he said, And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he's raised up Jesus. Now I'm going to stop there. Now it doesn't mean right there raising him up from the dead. It's more like in verse 22 where he said he raised up for them David. That's more the word used there, which doesn't mean David was resurrected. It means that he was brought into office. So he raised up Jesus means that God brought him into humanity, put him in the station he needed him to hold to become our Savior. Verse 32, and we declare you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled for this this for us, their children, that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So the promise in the psalm was that the son of God would be begotten as a man and would come into humanity. And from there he goes on. And that he raised him from the dead. Verse 34. No more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus. I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. That's Psalm 16, which clearly predicted that there would come a man who would not ever see corruption, which means this, that word for corruption, one whose body would not decay, would not disintegrate, would not decompose in the grave. That was Jesus. And Paul goes on to reinforce this thought in verse 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. In other words, you can't apply Psalm 16 to David. It's pointing us to someone who would come later, someone of the lineage of David who would never see corruption when he died would not decay and rot in the grave because this one would not stay dead. Witnesses saw Jesus alive after he died. He saw no corruption. You go there today, the tomb is still empty. He's not there. And with that telling, with that telling blow, Paul nails down the fact of his resurrection. He was seen by many witnesses. And now it comes to the heart of Paul's message, all the purpose of why all of that happened. And he drives it home, the hammer blow of this word, with the role and the goal of Messiah. In verse 38, he says, Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, that was an absolutely earth-shattering statement to all these people in the synagogue. Here were men who honored the law of Moses, who thought the Ten Commandments were the greatest word that God had ever given to men. They were trying their best to live up to them in one way or another, and many of them realized that they were failing. 
But they still thought that the way to God was to obey the Ten Commandments, to do good, to work harder, to do better at keeping the law, that they could earn righteousness. But now Paul comes to declare to them that they'll never make it on those terms, that they will never find acceptance in God in that way. You cannot be accepted by God on the basis of just trying to be good. The Ten Commandments will not help you develop righteousness. They will condemn you and point you to your own unrighteousness because you will never fulfill them in the entirety of what it means to fulfill the law. Each and every letter, each and every point, all ten of them in absolute perfection is necessary to be kept, to be righteous. No matter how hard you try, you will not be able to keep them. And you know it. In your heart of hearts, you know there's no way you can do it. And they did too. And Paul tells them, God has found a way to accept mankind even though no one can be good enough in themselves. And that way is through this man, Jesus Christ. Now we're accustomed to hearing that. That doesn't shake us. It should, but it doesn't shake us. But you can imagine how it shook these people. That was absolutely, like I said, earth-shattering. They had never heard anything like this before. This amazing news that God would accept them in entirety, in completion, would accept them. That believing in Jesus means we're free. We are justified that no matter what we do in ourselves, we could never have that through the law. And it's the first occasion that we have recorded of Paul's using the amazing word which he so frequently used in the book of Romans. Justification. What does it mean to be justified? Well, a lot of people think it means to have your sins forgiven. And yeah, it does mean that. But it means so much more than that. It means that in God's eyes, in God's eyes, because of the completeness of his, of his sacrifice, because of his completeness of his forgiveness, that he looks at you as if you have never, ever, ever even sinned before. But justification, to be able to have that, still required the debt of sin to be paid. It's not just a forgiveness with no cost, because just because you said, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, God, I sinned. Oh, okay, I forgive you. No, it, there was a, the greatest of cost, the sacrifice of the living God, of Jesus Christ to step out of eternity, out of the Trinity, out of the Godhead, to become man, to be brutalized at the hand of the creation, and to be killed on the cross. And that means God's giving of grace was not free for him. It's only free to us. Justification is to have your sins forgiven in such a way that God's honor and integrity are still preserved by it. So what Paul is really saying here is that you merely had your sins forgiven with no cost that satisfied the high price of that sin. If that was the case, then that would nullify the reality that sin does require a price to be paid. If God forgave in the way that most people I th think, think he does, that you just come to him and he's such a great loving God that he says, oh, forget about it. Yeah, I know you sinned, but forget about it. That's all right. Don't worry about it. You're such a good guy. You're trying real hard. You didn't kill anyone. You didn't steal stuff. You don't cuss much. And I love you so much, I'm just going to ignore it. It's okay. You earned enough merits. If that were the case, then God's honor would be demeaned. That wouldn't be love. That would be God ceasing to be holy, ceasing to be pure, ceasing to be pure, perfect. God's character would be defiled by that kind of forgiveness. He could no longer be regarded as the God of righteousness, the God of justice, the God of truth. He would become a partaker in my sins and a partaker in yours. And that is an absolute impossibility for a truly holy God. But God found a way through Jesus to lay the guilt of our life and heart upon his own son. And through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, he can preserve his righteousness, his honor, his character, his integrity, while at the same time he is rendered free to show his whole love, mercy, 
and grace to us. That's justification. That's what that means when Paul looks at you and says, you're justified. You are justified in, in Christ Jesus. The cost it took was immeasurable for God to be able to freely give us grace. Because of the cross, nobody will a- ever be able to point to God and say, oh, you let people off who are guilty. But he'll be able to say, yeah, I did, because the price was paid. It wasn't a Monopoly get out of free jail free card. They just handed it and said, oh, <laughs> caught me on a loophole. You have a get out of jail free card. Okay, I forgive you of your sins. No. The cost was great. The cross of Jesus. God poured out all of his justice, all of his wrath, all of the cost and the penalty of sins upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Where he had to turn his head away because of the darkness of it all, the pain of it all, where Jesus on the cross hung there. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He bore all of my sin and all of yours while he hung there, enduring the cross, despising the shame because he counted all the joy there would be at the end of a relationship with you and relationship with me. The cross of Jesus is an amazing thing. And in that cross and the agony and the anguish of it all, we should see a picture of of how faithfully God does obey his own laws. How he does carry out justice to the fullest degree of the cost and the penalty of sin. And yet the wonder of it is that because of it, God's love is freed to be poured out to us, ones who by no means deserve any of it. And yet he freely gives it to us. And because of Jesus Christ, the result of justification is absolute and full acceptance. If you accept the death of the Lord Jesus on your behalf and his life is given to you, you're justified from all things. Is that not a great word? Justification is an amazing thing to consider. It's an amazing thing. It means that God's unqualified love is poured out towards you. There is no rejection whatsoever for any cause. And that love begins to heal all of your scars all of your hurt, all of your anguish, all of your brokenness, and you start becoming a whole person simply on the basis of being justified by faith through Christ Jesus. It should be something that is absolutely incredible to consider. And in our humanness, I think we tend to think, well, that can't be. I can't take that. I've got to do something. I've got to do something. The only way God can find me acceptable is that I must make myself acceptable. I need to earn more of his favor. I've got to do all the right things. I've got to do it just so. But it will never be that way. No one can ever make themselves more acceptable to God by trying to live a good life. And no one can ever earn more justification by just being good. In our humanness, we tend to find this hard to grasp. I know I do. I just, I want to earn more. But that's the radical nature of this message. The radical character of this great word. That justification is freely given by God to us, sinful men and women, because of what Jesus Christ did. It was paid in full. And because of that, there's no more we could ever earn. That message shook that city when they heard it. Paul evidently saw some frowns, though, as he spoke in the synagogue because he immediately adds these words in verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken of the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work in your days a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. That's the incredibility of the gospel. Now, I don't think those words were spoken by Paul in sharpness. I think they were spoken in sadness, trying to reach them. 
Paul is saying here that when you hear the incredible word of grace, that God has found a way to love you and love you without qualification, but instead, by virtue of nothing that you've done and nothing you could ever do and nothing you could earn, but by what Christ has done for you, the reality is it's a moment of crisis in our life. You can either accept it and live in the glory of that love, or you can reject it and turn away. But if you reject it and turn away, Paul right there is saying, you're going to find yourself tremendously in danger. You're in danger of destroying yourself and of being destroyed because only God's love can rescue mankind. And that's why this message hit with such power in that city. Paul laid out before them the fact that the only way, the only way there is to freedom from guilt of sin is by the acceptance of the work of another on your behalf. God's love is absolutely poured out on that basis and that alone. And that is the relevant message the world still needs today. That God did all of that for us. Now, look at the results of the message. In verse 42, it says, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. And then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. The gospel is like a knife cutting its way through society, through the heart of mankind. It awakens, it hits with impact, and the reality is it divides. Everyone has to decide one way or another. Some decide for, some decide against. And like I said, it's not your job to make that decision for people. You can't do that. But you need to trust that the Holy Spirit will be at work. And that as you cast seed, that God is going to do what only God can do. Now some there wanted God, they cried out to Him. They were relieved and delivered. Others refused, turned away, they hardened their hearts. They destroyed themselves. That's what we see there. Certain Jews and devout converts, Gentile converts to Judaism, followed Paul and Barnabas who spoke to them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. How encouraging that must have been for Paul and Barnabas to receive that comfort, and that, that reinforcement, that, that keep going in what God has called you to do. But there were also those who were filled with jealousy and hostility who contradicted and reviled, that looked at the ministry, and when they saw the multitudes were filled with envy because of the crowds. Because the church was big. Oh, that church is getting bigger than ours. Oh, boy, I want that. They're not looking at me, they're looking at them. They were filled with envy. The size of a church doesn't matter. What matters is what God is doing. These people were filled with envy because they saw for themselves they were, losing a, they were losing the aplomb of the people. And they responded with jealousy, hostility, contradicting and reviling. And to them, Paul just points them to the Scriptures. He didn't go and try to fix everything. He just pointed them to the Scriptures. He showed them that the Scriptures authorized them to turn from the Jews and go to the Gentiles if the Jews refused this message. And he quotes Isaiah. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And then we're told, now when the Gentiles heard this, how'd they respond? Oh, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as as had been appointed to eternal life believed. The Gentiles responded to Paul's invitation with enthusiastic belief, learning with joy that God does not hate Gentiles, that he didn't hate them but that he offered them salvation in Jesus Christ too? This is for us too? What you just told them in the synagogue, we get to be a part of that? What a radically different message than anything else they must have heard 
from the synagogue. That it was just Jesus Christ. What joy at learning of the freedom of God's mercy and grace. And then the final result is given in the closing verses. In verse 49 it says, And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women. And the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. It indicates that Paul and Barnabas were there for an extended time, is what the, the, the passage is telling us. Probably several weeks during which the word of God went out into all the region around. And this amazing and powerful gospel which sets people free and relieves us of human guilt was shared throughout the region. But many of the Jews were disturbed by this. And as they could not prevail openly, they went around behind the scenes, stirred up the women to make contention, stirred up the prominent men, which wording means that it would have been some of the Roman authorities in the area to, to do so as well. And that way contention was coming at them from all sides. Now Luke, he has an amazing ability to be understated, to deliver quick, precise summaries, and so he doesn't give us all the details here. But Paul tells us later, that there were three times in his life when he was beaten by rods, an official punishment of the Romans, which could only be handed down through the authorities. Once we know, it was later in Philippi. And many commentators believe that here was another occasion, one of the first occasions, that Paul and Barnabas may have been brought before the Roman authorities and beaten with rods and then driven out of the district. Now Luke doesn't say so, but this could well be the time when that first happened to Paul. But in any event, they shook off the dust of their feet against them and they went to Iconium. But the last sentence, even after enduring that, going through that, I think it's beautiful. Verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The disciples, Paul, Barnabas, and the ones who were faithful to the Lord there in that region who remained in the area were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Joy a true fruit of the Spirit. They were filled with the joy of the Lord and the love of God regardless of circumstance, regardless of what was going on and raging around them. They weren't picketing. They weren't putting up Facebook posts. They weren't going to standing in front of City Hall demanding justice. But in response to all that God had done, they followed Him in joy and with the Holy Spirit. The great sign of the Spirit of God in our hearts. He floods our heart with love and joy regardless of what's going on when we're just following Him. If we're Christians, our heart should absolutely be moved, compelled at the mercy of God towards us that Paul just expressed throughout this passage in this sermon to the people of that region. We who deserve nothing from His hands have been given everything by Him. What an amazing thing God has done. What an amazing thing He's done through Jesus Christ. This gospel, this good news, is necessary and relevant today. Nothing's changed. Human heart hasn't changed. We see that. We talked all about what's going on in Eastern Europe. But the human heart hasn't changed. It still needs healing. From God, we're told that Jesus came to do something, that he came to bind the brokenhearted and he came to set the captive free, right? How many, when you walk around, do you see that are bound and broken and captive? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the reality is the good news of what God has done is the only relevant thing today that will ever ever change lives. Bind the brokenhearted and set the captives free. And to follow the commission to go and make disciples, it's an absolute must that any and every Christian should be ready to share, in turn, what God has done through Jesus Christ in their lives. You should be able to share that. You should be able to look at the simplicity with which Paul shared that. And speak life into the lives of other people too. That is not a call for Paul the Apostle exclusively. That is not a call for the 12 disciples exclusively. 
That was not a commission just for them. That was a commission to the church of Jesus Christ. Guess what you're a member of? The church of Jesus Christ. If you profess Christianity, if you profess that Christ is your Savior, then your responsibility, I'm not trying to cast guilt or dispersion upon you, but I'm, I'm imploring you to take with all seriousness what God has done in your life so that you are ready at any time to speak words of life to other people. You know, it's part of the reason it's been on my heart to do the foundations class. How are you going to go and make disciples if you don't even know what it is to be a disciple yourself? Do you know the cost of discipleship? Do you know what it is to follow Jesus? It's an important thing. It's the foundation of everything. And I can't encourage you enough to sign up for that class and be a part of it and start learning what it is to be ready in season and out of season. Because at the end of that book, the start book, very clearly is laid out what it means, what the gospel means. Very clearly it's laid out for anyone to understand exactly what the gospel is. And out of that, it should give you everything you need to be able to share with simplicity with other people what Christ has done for them. But more importantly, you need to be ready to share what Christ has done in you. It's far more effective. You can share all the head knowledge you want. But without the heart knowledge of what makes it personal for you, of what he's done for you, of what the amazing fact that you are justified in the fullness of what that word means, without that full impact of what that means to you, then you're reciting words. God's word doesn't come back void. That's true. But oh, how much more effective it is when you get to share from your heart what God has done in your life with other people. That's the call and the cost of Christianity. Now, if you don't want to do that, maybe you should consider not calling yourself a Christian. That's the reality of it. Because to be a Christian means to be a little Christ. It means that you are doing everything in your life pointed to becoming more and more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. If that's not what you want, then maybe we need to start there and discover why that's not what you want when God has done the most amazing thing in all of human history for you. Fall in love with your Savior. Discover what it means to be so in love with Him that you can't help but to shine and share His love with other people. And again, it doesn't matter what church you're in, what church you're from, what church you're a part of. You are a part of one church. That's part of the reason why Calvary Chapel doesn't have a membership. No, we're not membership cards. You don't get a little name badge saying, yeah, I'm a member of Calvary Chapel. Because we really hold the tenant that there's one church that Christ is coming back for. And that's where you're a member. You're a card-carrying member of the family of God, of the church of Jesus Christ, because of the seal that he's placed in your heart. You don't need anything else. Because that's enough. But oh, what God can do through anyone who is just willing to fall in love with Him. And I can't implore you enough. Learn what it means to be a Christian. Lord, we thank You. We thank You so much for the love that You poured out for us. The price that You paid for us to have a relationship with you. The reality of the cost of sin. What it cost for you to look at us and declare that we have been justified. The redemption price of freeing us from the slavery of ourself and the slavery of sin. What a magnificently amazing God you are. 
to be able to put together a plan that still allows for righteousness, justice, equity, that still allows for you to hold holiness and perfection while looking at us and saying, oh, I forgive you. Oh, I forgive you. I offer you grace and mercy. Not just because of my love for you, but because your price has been paid in full by me, the living God. Oh, may we stand in awe of our Savior. May we stand in so much reverence and awe before you that it absolutely changes our life. That we would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Less of me and more of you. John the Baptist had it right there. Less of me and more of you. The world doesn't need more of Brad. Oh, but how the world needs more of Jesus. Work in our lives, O oh Lord. And conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.